Welcome to another live stream here at LightingBot. Today we have Edward joining us. Uh, he's going to introduce himself a little bit. I don't think we have had him on our stream before, but we have had his colleagues on our stream before. So we are reaching out to juniors yet again, you know, making sure we can uh, get to know the juniors entering the industry. And he's been around for at least a year as far as I know, right? So he's uh, reaching experienced level already. So we're going to talk about different things. We're going to talk a little bit about lighting, obviously, art, obviously, maybe some games that inspire us. And we're going to go through some of his old work and kind of figure out, you know, how he would improve his work and uh, why would he do it a certain way. So you guys can get the perspective of before and after, and then we'll go with the flow. So if you're watching, please leave a hello and hi. So I know you're watching and, you know, like and subscribe and share so more people can join us as we talk. So, Edward, how are you doing? Yeah, no, I'm I'm doing pretty good. Um, it's uh, we finally get to talk. I know we've been trying to arrange this for a while. Um, so yeah, it feels good to be here finally. Um, I think I started following you, well, your channel when I first started getting into lighting, or pretty soon after I started getting into lighting. So yeah, it's like it's kind of like a full circle, which is kind of cool. Well, that's um, nice to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um. Yeah, it's nice to finally actually be be uh, one of the talking heads rather than listening to the talking heads. Yeah, yeah, obviously it's a, it's a it's a great opportunity for me as well to get to know you and for our reviews to know you as well. So you have been around a little bit, as you say. You've been watching streams and everything. So when you started out as as a as a as a aspiring artist, I suppose. So talk a little bit about what you did before and what made you want to become a lighting artist. Yeah, so I think what made me want to be a lighting artist would be my second year of university when we were told to basically specialize in our course, like pick, pick an avenue you want to go down. And I found myself, I was doing a game design course at the time, and I found myself feeling like I wanted to be more involved in the art. Um, like I enjoyed the game design, but I wanted to be more involved in the art. So I, you know, I was looking at different roles, what might suit me. And like lighting artists came up and this was back back when lighting art was just like a, an emerging kind of um, split from what was environment art at the time oh that's that's what, what i read at least um so i spoke to my lecturers and they um were happy that i i found a path but they were uh, a little bit um apprehensive because they knew it was like a new thing and it was you know very niche um so they advised me to try something else so i went into level design uh which i enjoyed as well um it's got a few overlaps of lighting art um and then that's what i progressed through uni and what i uh, did my streams with initially but then i found myself enjoying uh enjoying the lighting art aspects still like that like that would be the bit i look forward to in my level design stuff like i can't wait to light this stuff even if it's basic lighting pass i can't wait to do that um so i made the i made the choice i was like you know what i'm gonna be a lighting guyist i know it's gonna be difficult but i'm I'm gonna be a lighting guyist and um so i started reading up on it i started reaching out to people joining discords um and i basically uh yeah started pursuing a career in it um and as I made that decision, that's when someone you had in the podcast before, um, George Garton, reached out to me and he was like, hey, Ed, uh, you still interested in lighting? Uh, I've just kind of like, you know, started going into it myself. Uh, here's some cool tools and stuff for you to like look at or here's some YouTube videos and stuff for you to look at. And so he helped me out and get me like help me um, on my path, my learning path down towards lighting up. So, yeah, that's basically how he got there um cool uh that's interesting for sure um i mean for for a lot of people it's interesting that a lot of people are helping people behind the scenes uh, and, and not in the public discord as well i find that intriguing to understand as well um so you've been doing a little bit of projects so i, I guess you can at least tell people the the current project you're working on um, yeah, so I'm currently working on the new Transformers uh, game, uh, Transformers Reactivate. Uh, that's uh, it's been a pretty cool learning curve. Uh, I've learned a lot from the guys that I'm working with. Um, there's definitely uh, my art has definitely improved a lot since starting there. They, I know in university they said when you get into industry they'll basically re like reteach you everything, 
um and i might i might have like kind of dust like dust it off my shoulder like oh, i'm i'm sure i know quite a bit already but no i i came in and some of the stuff they were telling me was how to use how to use things that i've been using for like at that point like a year or two just i was so i was surprised to say the least <laughs> i was like what that is interesting so in terms of you um having learned something prior to joining the industry and then joining the industry are there something you remember that okay you learned something uh, from somewhere online <laughs> and then it might have been um, different when you actually start working in the industry um yeah so yeah. something that i i because until until recently i'd only be, i'd still been using baked light in until i got my um new graphics card with one of my previous jobs i upgraded and i was like oh i can finally do real time um so i was using rc uh, reflection captures rcas and uh i didn't know until it was pointed out to me that you can actually use an rca um in like interesting ways to help kind of like put out some light with like the brightness settings of the rca um and i it never occurred to me that you could use an rca as like a cheap light source using the brightness settings and stuff. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd always using it as, as it says on the tin, uh, to, you know, help the reflections and the cube maps. Uh, so yeah. Um, I know it's like, it sound, might sound like a basic thing to you. I know you're a senior, you're probably like, it's a fairly obvious thing, but, um, I mean, there's always something new to learn, isn't there? I mean, uh, some people use reflection probes to uh, they'll bake the reflection probe and then they'll uh, put the light to get some reflection and then they'll remove the light but store it in the cube map of the reflection. So, I mean, people have all kinds of interesting, uh, creative ways of, of doing their, their work. And I think at the end of the day, because, you know, I think... Uh, some people will fake uh, the reflection as well. Some people will do quite a few tricks uh, that's unorthodox. And I think it comes with experience, but it also comes with understanding uh, the technical things and uh, what, we, what we actually end up doing. And I think a lot of my fellow seniors, um, if you watch some of the other podcasts we do at these days, we talk quite often about... Um, juniors and students making their portfolio and it's all just pretty and there's no clear indication or understanding of uh, actual pipeline or production because even if you do cinematic there are certain restrictions and things to be aware of but i guess it's difficult to learn it um because no one is well it's difficult to teach it it's time yeah. consuming to explain it so i guess you need to just uh try your best uh what's your experience been in terms of learning so far and the learning resources and even becoming a, a lighting artist um how has that been for you so yeah starting obviously i kind of started off uh on a bit of a different path with my light my level design background um so in terms of learning what i what I did for that is uh, I had to basically go back to basics and try and get my teach myself like that, like artistic eye that everybody talks about, get trying to train up that eye that, you know, is often thrown around because um, I was looking at things a lot of the time from like a level design point of view, which is um, which has its uses in terms of like guiding players and verticality and stuff like that and picking out details. But um it also has its limitations. Uh, so I had to yeah, go back to basics, uh, look at some uh, YouTube videos. There's like a, a good one that I remember is like Lighting Academy. That's like a pretty good like intro. Um, there's like uh, William uh, Fal Faulkner, I, Faulkner, I believe. Like if I, I probably butchered his second name, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, he's got some great like, like UE5 stuff at the moment, like some beginner, like UE5 stuff and some more like high end stuff, which is really interesting. Um, and uh, so I've been reading, I've been like looking at those. And then also you got books like, um, I believe uh, Color of Life, I think is a really good book. And that's, it's more of a, tradi a traditional art book, but a lot of traditional art skills are transferable into digital art and into lighting art with how you use light and how you fake light. I am. You know how you fake that bounce light and how you you know maybe skew skew the uh environment a little bit in terms of where the light it would believably go just to help pick out some some dark spots and illuminate those a little bit okay 
And uh, I mean, when you're speaking about, because um, I noticed you said you, you're looking, most of your references obviously are more or less free resources, but the book obviously doesn't come free, I imagine, mm. unless unless you did, uh, you know, found a free version online. <laughs> That's a different <laughs> topic altogether. It's, it's not that difficult to find them online, unfortunately. Um, so, th- so you still find value in books like old? Yeah painting books or color book and you, you you would recommend people to take the time and, and pick up on that oh yeah 100 percent. like uh looking at um light uh, art books and maybe even like drawing books for like helping with your perspective and like uh, if you're doing like camera work like helping you understand perspective and uh well, photography and cinematography like there's a load of good books for that like liam wong has some great photography books where he has some great color going on in those as well which can also help as reference. So it's all it's all about surrounding yourself in different art mediums and then being able to look at those and be like, I like what they've done here. How can I translate this to this? And you know, it might not be one to one, but it might you might be able to take certain aspects of it and transfer it. And then that that could be the thing that elevates your work from something that is, you know, just okay to where you've done something interesting. You know, because you know you're implementing something that maybe not a lot of people are doing. Um, so okay, and um, since you've been uh, um, since you mentioned already a few times about improving and and growing and and learning, why don't we just quickly uh, have a look at your work so far in in our station, <laughs> and then uh, kind of talk a little bit about you know your intention behind it. How did you learn it? Why did you do it? And also, what would you do differently now and when you look at it? Yeah, yeah, sounds great. So I'll just click the add to stream. Is that okay? Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I'm good to go. Um, Let me see. Where is it? I don't see it anywhere. (laughs) Should I I reshare it? Yeah, try doing it. Okay. We got this. We got this. Hey, Pranoy. Hey, Edwin. Thanks for watching. There we go. That's weird. Is it me who don't see it? Do you guys see anything or no? Oh, there we go. A little bit of delay. (laughs) Problem solved. All right. So uh, walk us through some of your pieces. So this was the first piece I did now uh, three years ago. Um, so this was me coming out of level design and being like, I want to tackle a, uh, you know, a, a kind of smaller scene and make it my own. Um, you've probably seen this uh, train car a million times. Uh, everyone's done a relight of it, it seems, which it's fair enough. It's like a nice, solid scene. Um, so basically at the time I was looking, I was playing a lot of control and I was like, uh, and so the, obviously it's got some control vibes like last of us was also a, a thing in my mind um so also i've got that going on so i spent some time gathering reference and kind of like looking at what i was playing or really enjoying at the moment and i was like well i want to try and do something that would feel like it belongs in that kind of thing so i went with the you know re- i removed i stripped back all of the lights all of the emissives and i went i went with like a bare bait like looking at it from a basic point of view. Um, and I decided on this um, this kind of scene of a character at the back illuminated by a torch and a road flare. Um, and uh, then I worked with uh, within UE to um, change the emissive intensities of the lights leading up to it to help guide the player's focus towards the back of the train car. Um, now in terms of how uh looking at this how i would improve it um just to jump onto that a bit the there are some aspects that are maybe a little bit too intense and there are some aspects that are maybe too dark and when i first came into it uh i didn't really understand how to play with such a low range of light uh in a in a in a in a balanced manner as well as blending your layers and making sure you've got that separation going. So I've got fog going on in here, um, but it's all very like one note. There's no, there's not much of a gradient that leads you towards the back. It's uh, as a fog would normally do. Like you never 
normally get just a thick one note blanket of fog right so that's one of the issues i would address is i would try and get a little bit more um control over my layering with the fog um and that would definitely help separate those layers out i think the other thing that i would definitely try start improving as uh, i'd improve upon as well is um the uh, neon the what the like led sign here i uh, i've you can see quite obviously where i've got the um source radius for the light i haven't really disguised the source radius too well and uh you know it's kind of causing that kind of orange streak there um so it it doesn't it's it's like it's kind of okay on the side bits because you it's, you can it's more believable that it's like hidden light sources there or something but on this on this sign especially with how um depowered everything is one it's on which i could i would probably turn off nowadays anyway um but if i was if i were to leave it on and have it damaged of some kind i would definitely try and disguise that source radius um it's more the tertiary reads like the small scale reads that i would change about this scene um and help try and like blend those colors in um and hide those source radiuses the uh like the red as well is all was all like one saturation there's not like any kind of uh slow uh, change of the like value of the red either as you kind of make your way down towards the back of the train just kind of like sure it fades out but it there's no like uh change in the in the value of that red as it fades out it just kind of just like stops and goes into like normal light color so i'd probably try and blend that in a bit more with the white lights that are coming from the uh from the train from the train cart here um i think i think that would just doing those things alone uh would also would just help to elevate this scene um in terms of its uh viewability if that makes sense um i don't know if you have any points if you want to like chime in and stuff i've got a i've got a couple more but uh no let's uh, let's hear off your couple of more and, and see what you say i think um in terms of like the usage of the road flare um where where is it is i is causing a lot of the red light uh i've kind of it's it's the it's the hottest point in the scene now if i were to try and draw the player's eye back to the character here your eye is first drawn to the road flare and then maybe you start looking around at the other bright points now at the time i didn't really uh i understood that i want wanted the people to see the, the character at the back but until you until you kind of uh point it out especially in this shot you can't really it's a bit hard to see him because the torch is so um overshadowed by the road flare so i probably would have played with those values a bit more those intensities to try and get get it where the road flare is believable with how intense it is and how much red it's putting out into the scene but then also played with the torchlight in order to rim light that character a bit more to help draw the uh eye to this uh you know this unfortunate soul at the back of the train um whilst also trying to uh dull down some of these like high intensity specular responses that i have going on that i just kind of like pinpoint like they're not spread out on these like poles which you would kind of expect they're just kind of in one area you would kind of expect that in this kind of a darker environment with how bright that specular is for it to be more over this whole shiny kind of like metal surface so i play with the materials a bit more as well and the reflections to uh kind of help just kind of get the blendings going get the separation of layers going and uh just help kind of like ground it uh in like the realistic kind of lighting that i'm kind of doing here um yeah i mean yeah definitely there's uh always room for improvement isn't there when you i mean even my own pieces i look at them yeah yeah i could probably improve it so this it's a, it's a never-ending um 
improvement uh, fast really yeah. you're never gonna stop improving or or adjust your work to a certain degree i think you just have to be able to understand what you're doing and uh, have a strategy really more than anything uh, yeah probably goes a little bit uh further i think um <clears throat> Uh, I would definitely have, uh, yeah. I think I think you're spot on in terms of some of the areas. I mean, I would some of your uh, some of your work, obviously. Um, the you have lights on 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 the roof. I would probably either have dimmed them or allow them to illuminate uh, the scene a bit more. Um, it's, yeah, um, they aren't really doing much on the ceiling here, where you'd expect the light to be kind of bleeding up and hitting the ceiling. Yeah, definitely you would have done him. I would probably also consider a bit more bluish and then add mm. some purplish into the picture. Yeah, um, yeah. Using some like dark blues, like soft dark blues to illuminate the shadows to bring so the details don't get lost. But they yeah. still look like shadows. Yeah, you definitely want to have some because you know when you have different colors, they color mix, right? Mm. So being able to mix them up a little bit, I think. Uh, it's also a personal taste, a lot of it, um, how you would do it. But definitely in terms of what you have on in your scene, I would have expected a bit more um, um, illumination in the front. Uh, yeah. and, and then some compensation. Probably you would have to do something further down at the back to yeah. deal with the fact that you have a... It's interesting because your light flare is away from the brightest areas. It's in the in the brightest area either. So um, I found that a very interesting choice as well. Because um, when you look at your image, um, and uh, I think it's like on the right side, I think, and then the, this goes, you know, yeah. it illuminate. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting how it's. Uh, illuminating as much as it does <coughs> and it's like quite bright further away but it's not bright around the chairs yeah yeah um i found that kind of interesting uh, to observe as well um and then it's just playing with the colors i would imagine you know you need to be able to be a bit comfortable with uh, different color tone as well mm -hmm. when you work mm -hmm. with these kind of things uh, but it's a personal piece and i think there's many ways to honestly approach these kind of uh, uh, projects uh, I did mine as a joker replication uh, instead and uh, I remember it was a fun experience in this scene as well and um, yeah I definitely would uh, I can show you very quickly I was yeah that'd be great um, yeah I, I, I don't think it's a, like a bad scene. Like I've got the kind of visual storytelling with the assets I placed and stuff. But yeah, I think coming into it, it's definitely illuminating those dark spots and then just making sure all of the intensities play nice with each other. I think that's a very key thing. Um, you know, you should um, try and focus on when you're lighting a scene is making sure that there's a there's a good balance between everything and then a blending between those balances. It's obviously very difficult with these kind of images to to uh, do what you want to do, but I would at least consider to push the top a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see if I were to do it, or if I were to attempt to do it, would be the right word. Uh, <clears throat> I would probably. Uh, so this is your version. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty uh, monochrome in terms of it is red and then there's some light in front and uh, I would have added a little bit of color in front and mm. let the light be a little bit bright. I probably wouldn't have it as bright in the back either, but I definitely would focus on having some intensity. But then we have talking about composition as well, right? You, you, your, your focal point is at the back, so I, I might have um, gone in and, and kind of dim it down a little bit or at least have some light coming in. Um, uh, maybe I would have considered making it pop, but, but the problem with fog is, especially when you're doing what I'm doing uh, in this example, it flattens the image a lot. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does tend to wash it out if you if you go a bit like heavy-handed with it. So I think, generally speaking, and then there's depth of field. Probably it's possible to kind of use that as well as an advantage. So you you might uh, 
sharpen the back a little bit to fix the fact that it's kind of difficult to see everything and kind of emphasize the, that. So I would probably have done something. I probably wouldn't have that red color. I would probably have mixed it a bit uh, so it makes sense that the color mm. are mixing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it definitely... So this is where people would cheat. They would uh, move. The, they would make a reflection box here, and they would readjust it just to get rid of these specs. Um, yeah, I personally don't do it a lot because um, I think I like to keep it somewhat uh, believable. Yeah, uh, I, I I like to keep my work honest as well. Like uh, like Da Vinci is a great tool, by the way. Like color correcting in Da Vinci is it gives you that kind of level of control that un Unreal's color color grading and stuff is is good but it da vinci just has that finer level of control um so it's good to if you can take it into that it's good to do that um but yeah i i like to try and keep my work honest so to speak i don't particularly like to touch it up too much after like in photoshop or da vinci after i've done it um i know it's maybe not the best way to go around things but um in i feel like in if I'm in the studio, I the player isn't going to see my Photoshop image. They're going to see my Unreal image or your game engine of choice image, right? So I feel like if you can get good at trying to get what you make in Photoshop in Engine or in DaVinci in Engine, then you know you you're like you're you're probably on the way on the on the way to something good right there. Yeah, it definitely depends on the studio, right? Um... If you have a good code and tech team, you might be able to implement some of these uh, color grading mechanics more seriously into into the engine, like Calypso Protocol did. Mm -hmm. Or um, my workflow tends to be, um, if I need to be very quick uh, for whatever reason, or if I don't want to spend time doing something in engine, but I want feedback very quickly, I'll throw it into DaVinci, I'll throw it into Photoshop, I'll do the quick tweaks and I'll send it and then get the a green mark. Mm -hmm. And then if I get the green mark, I then replicate it in engine more or less yeah. closely as possible. It's not going to be as closely because the thing with game engine versus painting and concept art when you're being told to do that is in painting is much easier to fade the light and control the light because you're doing every brush stroke but in engine because of the math you know it's still gonna jump around to a certain degree so yeah. um it takes a bit more i suppose um some people would add extra light with different color to fade it manually but then even without shadow uh cost there's reflection cost and there's transparency yeah. cost there's still other things people seem to forget yeah. a little bit if, if you're if you're if you've got tools uh to your hand that allow you to adjust the fade the fade like the fade range of the lights and stuff that still in itself is an extra cost and it's it's uh like it's yeah don't get me wrong like davinci photoshop great tools great tools for like editing photos make them look nice and stuff but then like i think they should be in addition to your to your work they shouldn't be like what you you know you aim to do the touch-ups in you know it's like you should maybe take it there to see how you could make it look and how, what improvements you can make you know turning the contrast between stuff down or up or saturation down and up and then bringing that knowledge into engine and trying to replicate it i think i think that's uh or oh, getting as close as possible to that concept art, to that image that was created in DaVinci or Photoshop. Um, yeah, definitely. I think it's a good way to give feedback and, and, and critique, uh, but you do still need to learn how to do it in, in engine um, yeah. as much as possible. But that's that's where the learning curve is, I think, is, is ability to understand how do you do it in the engine, how do you tweak it uh, as much as you need to tweak it to get the the necessary result that you actually mm -hmm. want yeah. um i think that is a challenge for a lot of people in general and that's okay um but it that's why the experience just... yeah it comes with experience yeah you just gotta keep keep at it and yeah. uh, just keep doing it and keep doing it and and uh, not give up really mm -hmm. uh, that's that's one of the main things i learned coming in uh over these like years and stuff is it's it's, it's sometimes it's not the easiest journey 
but sometimes it's the necessary one is to take the difficult kind of like answers like sometimes i've had you know like i've gone into discords and i've talked to senior line artists and stuff and they've been like this isn't working like you need to like rethink some of your choices here and sometimes it's a bit difficult to hear that about my own work because you know you're, you're passionate about something it can be a bit difficult to take that in but being able to take in good criticism and like filter out like the like the toxic because sometimes you get toxic stuff and it's like just being mean for the sake of being mean but then sometimes you get some like it might be hard criticism but it's like needed you know like if someone's like you know the choices you're making here like i can see what you're doing but as they are now they aren't working and it's not necessarily telling you to delete it and start again it's saying you need to maybe take a step back and come back to it and and think from like how can i how can i maybe reposition it how can i how can i make what i'm trying to achieve here work and it's, it's yeah getting the skill to take criticism is a very important one yeah a lot of people are uh, sensitive to it um some people um uh... People are sensitive in general in my book these days, so it's a bit different time these days. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful on how you give critique, and that's why in our Discord you're required to provide your own information on what have you done, what what are you looking for, what type mm -hmm. of critique do you want, so you don't end up in a situation where you're asking for feedback and then you're lashing out to someone spending the time to try and help you. That's not really nice to do. Like yeah. people, people in general are busy but people such as myself and and people who are doing multiple things in this spare time uh, you do not want to be in a situation where they're spending time helping you and you're just completely ignoring it that yeah. that's that's not a very uh, smart thing to do and that's not to say people are right when they give the feedback because there's again this different perspective for yeah. example if you uh, if we talk about your skull render yeah um, get that up on the screen uh, I think that's an interesting one because I have a. I would like you to explain your choices and and thought process and what you would change. And then I think it's good, a uh, good idea for people to see there's a different way of doing things and both ways are good ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this was my one of my first kind of like dives into UE5. Um, so UE5 had just come out at this point, or is fairly new at this point. And I was really interested in macro photography as well. Um, and I wanted to see if I could do something on like a close-up scale using as few lights as possible to kind of tell, to create an interesting scene. Um, so this is where I'd started learning about some camera angles and like different lenses and stuff. And um, it's very important uh, with how you display your work to understand like aspect ratios and like positioning of cameras like rule of thirds and and like uh, you know different kind of techniques in order to help just elevate your elevate your pictures so um, in terms of the light light stuff that I tried to go for here I've gone for the key light my main light being the directional which is a fairly neutral over like kind of like an overcast kind of like midday kind of vibe uh, to help give the butterfly some interesting shadows um as uh as that's the one of the, like you know the skull and the butterfly want to be the main focal point so i've helped that by using some depth of field to blur out the background and that helps keep the skull and the butterfly in focus um you know i've i've also used uh some very soft like blue light to help illuminate the dark darkness of the uh the foliage at the time ue5 didn't handle a foliage uh, in nanite which i didn't know at the time so i got some stuff off mega scans and it came off as this like kind of spiky pyramids uh so but i think it can handle it uh, better now so um i've tried to disguise it here with some actual like placed foliage stuff which i think works but um yeah, the main thing is I've I've illuminated those shadows like we'll talk about in that train scene with those light blue colors. And that's very, it's a very useful tool because it doesn't make the shadows look unbelievable. It just helps you be able to distinguish some of the detail that's within those shadows, but keeping them feeling like shadows. Um, 
but the main focus I wanted and the brightest point I wanted to be was this butterfly and like this skull. Like that was where I wanted all the all the attention to be drawn. Um, and here's like a little breakdown of what I've done for the lights. Um, so yeah, cool. it's it's not a big scene. Um, it doesn't no. always need to be a big scene, and sometimes it doesn't need to be a complex lighting setup either. Um, like I think it's a it's a fine looking scene. Like I've got some fog going on in there as well to help do that kind of shadow, like that light blue shadow thing I was on about as well. Um, I don't think it needs to always be a million lights with a massive scene the size of Skyrim or something. You know, um, sometimes it can just be one hero piece with like you know and uh you know you just light it and you just try and like play with those values and just you know maybe do like your own little study of how to balance lights how to blend those lights i think that's, that's sometimes a really good thing to do is just like just bring yourself down a bit it's it's never bad you want to know what i would do <laughs> yeah you want to hit me <laughs> uh, this is just uh, a fun exercise for all of us really uh because I think it's important for people to be confident in what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm happy to take criticism. So I would, uh, so this is yours. Mm -hmm. I would do this. I would have warm light coming on the butterfly to give a sense of hope. Oh, yeah. And then I would have a purple blue uh, feel light around. So there's still a bit of, of cold mm. feeling to it. But then you look at, so instead of just having the skull and the butterfly, well, my primary focus would be the butterfly with a warm tint tone to it. And then the secondary would be the skull. But when you glance down to the skull and the scene, you get a bit of more of a you know, deathly feeling, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. But not too much, not over the top, but enough as well. Um, of course, I wouldn't have the sharp shadow. I would have made this diffuse as well, or maybe very briefly. Um, that's another detail that I noticed. But overall, I would go from having a very... So I am only talking about it because it's already been a year, so it's okay to, to give you the, my point of view. But yeah, obviously, this is... A, a, so this has what I call... Uh, the whole image has a focal point to it in the sense of value. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's just, so, that's mainly because of little, because you're trying to do two focal point, but uh, in terms of lighting, but also because of color. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. Like the contrast, the, color. the contrast of the warm light with the, the cool light coming from the skull definitely helps also elevate the, elevate the kind of imagery as well i think that's really cool you could do an opposite as well you could if i were not doing this i would probably have made still a bit warmer probably overall some of this area so it would maybe make the the skull a bit warmer and then keep this area cool so there are many ways to approach this which is my point here is there's different uh area of focus but this is more uh my art direction i would have gone with with this shot and scene and i can only talk about it because i i've, I've been doing this for a while <laughs> if i was in your situation uh, as, no, you know, I, it's it's fine i'm happy to happy to take it like uh it's one of the points i was going to touch on later on is like values like i had a uh, early on i had a trouble uh getting my values like correct um or like you know picking out those points to have the difference in um values and contrasting colors and stuff like it's it's something that you pick up over time and so you know some people pick it up really instantly like just like you know bam and then some people it's like a learning process that's a bit more back and forth and for me at least it, it's been a bit a bit more of a back and forth uh, and i'm happy to hold my hands up and say i wasn't I, I wasn't the best and i'm still not the best at it but i i think hopefully now that I've, I've definitely got my eye back in uh you know more into it and i can see you know how to get that that contrast in how to get that storytelling a bit bit better i mean it's definitely a learning curve um but i think also a lot of people underestimate color like it can do a lot of mm -hmm. different things if you just do color but a lot of people have a tendency to oversaturate it's actually a very common as humans because we we have a tendency to see things it's more saturated than it really is uh so a lot of work is 
bit too red or too green and uh, a good practice if you look at very classical paintings is it's not very saturated they are very careful with keeping the tone uh, subtle um, so you know studying painting and you can't see it because I've it's it's packed on at the moment but I have my paintings in the background so I do painting as well and it helped me a lot uh, only thing that screws my brain when I do painting is it's a different color palette. So this it's the, it's not you know it's subtracting additive. So when you stop painting and do color mix, it's like oh it's a, it's the wrong one. I'm not working with light anymore. So you, you screw up and you end up with like gray goo stuff painting, and you're like oops, I screwed yeah. that one up. The uh, um, the the interesting way to look at lighting a scene is that you are painting the environment with your light, right? Like that's like an like an like a, I found a helpful way for me to look at scenes is how would I approach this blank canvas this environment with with color like where are my light sources where are my hidden light sources you know uh what's the if you know if there is a sense of storytelling going on in here what kind of colors aid that like is it like a cool kind of environment like am I trying to make the player feel kind of cold and spooked out am I trying to make them feel like intense and you know kind of like it's going to be like an intense kind of like fast pace moment like so you can use more reds or more blues and you know complementary yeah. colors definitely you have a question or we have a question on that yeah. uh, marco uh, is asking are there any exercises for improving lighting what you do of course in addition to actually relighting scenes for example working only in black and white or only one color for improving composition and balance mm. yeah yeah do you um, have any tips advice something that worked for you at least so i think i think there there's a few like obviously one of the main main ways to improve lighting i found is to uh you know just just practice it <laughs> like that to just put it simply like you just you practice it you you get feedback on it you then move that to your next piece so you practice that but then in order in terms of exercises yeah like looking at your work in black and white um can really this is where like photoshop or da vinci can come in handy uh can really help you see those values right so see what is showing up as the white hot points what's showing like you know as the black dark points and then can maybe help you correct those values so that's where taking your work into photoshop or another photo edit in software can help you adjust those values and you know you can start seeing what is too dark or what's too bright with uh you know, just with your artistic eye, you know, maybe uh, help you get your eye in that way. I definitely recommend, you know, some level of like black and white stuff would would help. Yeah. Uh, what, what about yourself? Uh, I think one thing I have my students do, uh, depending on if they're struggling or what, I give them specific exercises to their personality because um, people are different. Some mm -hmm. people are good at something. Some people just struggle with something else. Um, I think doing a black and white and then looking at the black and white in color afterwards should teach you about something might look good in black and white, but once you have the texture and materials, it looks a bit off for some reason. And understanding why it looks off will teach you about the color and the tone of the materials and how it impacts your values and i think that's a very good practice and i do think it's a good practice to do lighting with just one light and practice how much can you light in the of an environment with just one light and i do think it's a good practice to do the opposite because uh, in game lighting it's not uncommon that we use many small lights to control our light rather than having a big light because big lights they overlap and that's more expensive so very common when we do real-time lighting we'll do a little bit light there a little bit there but no one has a huge radius mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good practice too and then showcasing it on your art station explaining what you're practicing is definitely a good thing uh, especially if you want to work in the games uh, that is a quite important i think yeah yeah i definitely agree um making sure uh, another thing that will come in handy as well is making sure you keep an eye on optimization for your lights as well um and that's something when i was doing my personal work i maybe played a bit fast and loose with but um getting into industry and like um doing my studio work is something i have to pay more attention to is the lighting complexity of my scene um, and it's kind of like a fun little puzzle in itself. It's like, 
you can sure you can do like your first pass with it being a bit chaotic in terms of overlaps and stuff but then it's like figuring out how can i make my scene look like this but with like the overlaps being you know vastly reduced or is there other lights i can use instead of like the point light can i use like a spotlight to do the same thing but kind of control the like the radius a bit more you know um you know there's some very interesting ways to uh, uh improve your lighting skills from the optimization point of view as well which uh, leads us to the next question. When you go about lighting your shots, do you focus on optimization or do you focus on aesthetics, uh, not using excess lights, which you don't need to, for example? Hmm. I think there's a balance to be struck. Um, I think in terms of like my personal work, I, I maybe lean more towards the more aesthetic, kind of like expensive way of lighting things because I know it's not going to be like for gameplay stuff which maybe isn't the best way to be <laughs> but i maybe lean i maybe i maybe uh i maybe i maybe let some more expensive complexities through that in my in my studio work i would normally kind of snuff out because i know that could that could like hinder frame rate or that could like you know cause some areas of issues where there's like a load of lights overlapping um so i probably depends on the situation I'm in, um, but I normally would nowadays. I would normally skew more towards the optimization route. Um, that's long and short of it. I would normally try and make my scenes optimized. Uh, I do want to point out to you, Joe, that I see you specifically said shots. Uh, so if you're talking about animation and cinematic, um, obviously it tends to be probably seventy percent aesthetics. And and then the rest needs to be optimized in terms of uh, as as Edward said um, for rendering time and other costs that does occur because too many lights isn't generally what I would recommend because when you work in a team and you have a lot of iterations there's a lot of feedback loops there's a lot of changes that can occur and even with good naming convention it's very tedious to do relights or change everything uh, or do updates if you have way too many lights and then you have to go on each every and every light and you have to do like tweaks and then you kind of spend too much time doing it so it's definitely a good idea to learn how to do good lighting uh, with few lights now will you have it as good as someone who does more lights probably not but you'll be doing a lot more work get done you'll you'll be more efficient and you'll actually be able to do overall a good quality because you're able to keep up with the deadlines and production workflow um but there will be hero shots like when I did Ghost Recon Breakpoint, there was the Splinter, uh, um, Sam Fisher scenes and shots. Um, they were very complicated and they were hero shots. Uh, so my lead was doing it. I wasn't the one doing it. He was showing me how to do it and how he would approach it. But uh, it was such a tedious. He would spend several days on just this, this small in-game cutscene sequence, uh, turning on the lights on and off, and the you know, rim light and the reflection on the eyes and all of it, uh, because that's a hero uh, sequence or hero scene even uh, as well. Uh, and I think you notice that in some of the... I've been playing Diablo 4 a lot uh, in my spare time, not that I have spare time. Um, and then I've noticed that some of the environments in Diablo 4 have obviously gotten more attention because it's part of the main campaign versus things like side dungeons or something you might or might not visit obviously have less attention. So that's also something to keep in mind. That's uh, something you discuss with the with the production and, and with the team, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Where the, where the um, and also if you if you light things, uh, you you can do different passes, right? You like you don't just light something, and when you when you light it, it has a padlock on it. You can't come back to it. Like you can always come back to it, and especially if you light things with the uh, with the mindset of you will have like a couple more chances to come back and touch things up. As long as your folder structure is like fairly neat and tidy, you can quickly dip between those lights, and then uh, you can always add some more in, take some more out. Like you can do passes, like and slowly build up your complexity, right? And uh, with your and then in in tandem with your environment team and your art director, you can you know make that kind of more complex scene come to life.
I think. Uh, we have more questions. Uh, Pranoy is asking, except for the artistic side, what are the technical skills a lighting artist should have in order to survive in the industry? Because uh, we're dying. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, just press the light up button and it and it just happens. Um, no, uh, I think technical wise, uh, having a understanding of how materials interact with light, that's a very important one. Like understanding, um, understanding what you can change on a material to, in, you know, um, to, to play with that light bounce and how, how the metallic and this, you know, interacts with it or the roughness and stuff like that. I think that's very, very important. Um, that can even play into the deeper side of, you know, making materials in like substance designer or something. If you want to go down that route as well, um, I think that's important. Uh, in terms of other technical stuff, then you've always got like, uh, if you're using Unreal, like blueprints, like, like you can make some interesting lights with blueprints and have some different functionality uh, with those lights and blueprints. Um, I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, there's like it doesn't need to be grand scale like an uh, entire weather system. Like you don't need to, you, you know, so that that can be, you know, maybe you can make that, and that's cool if you can. But like you can, if you make, if you if you can be like little personal things of like maybe you make like a widget or a tool that just helps you flick between optimization viewpoints. Like that's a technical skill in itself because it's saving you time. And it's also something other artists can use on your team. Um, and that's, I think that's, that's also a useful skill that's sometimes overlooked as well, because it's smaller, you know, it doesn't need to be a big grand gesture. It can be like small little techniques that, that help build up to the wider thing. I think. What, yeah. What uh, yeah. no, I agree. Um, yeah, you definitely need to play, uh, magic the gathering and you need to have this whole shelf you see here of cards and you need to play with the whole department and make friends that's that's what you need to do uh no um definitely i agree with with that but, but also you didn't necessarily ask that but i do want to emphasize soft skills communication skills collaboration yeah. skills ability to uh, know uh, materials is very important as a lighting artist so very often the 3d environment artist or 3d artists aren't as well equipped as you would expect when it comes to making correct materials uh i don't know why that is the case but uh, pretty much every project or every company the lighting artist ends up often being the person who investigates the materials and often explains it and make sure it's PBR correct, has the base values of gray and so on and so forth. So understanding that is very important. Explaining it in a non uh, demeaning way is very important. Just, you know, being able to pass on knowledge is, is a huge advantage because even if you're the lighting artist, you're going to get questions about how you do this, what's going on. You're going to get it from um, programmers. You're going to get it from other people. But I do think technical skills generally, if you can learn some programming, if not full programming, I do recommend it at this day and age. I think it is going to be more difficult to become a lighting artist in the next couple of years because you probably... Most of us do need to be more technical lighting artists because things are very technical and it saves the company money if you can do some of the stuff that Edward mentioned. Uh, I'd, most technical lighting artists also earn more, so it's a good way of getting paid more. Um, I have a zero idea of how to make a complete, fully functional weather system that works yeah. because uh, normally, in my experience, I have an expert programmer do it or they support it with a technical lighting artist who has a computer science background and then they do something together. But often you need to know at least uh, how it works and that requires some technical understanding so you can explain uh, how it should function, how it should be calculated and someone else can implement it. So. That's some of the things to keep in mind um, when it comes to technical skills as a lighting artist. I don't think it should be avoided. Uh, I personally don't do it more than I need to, uh, but I do recommend picking up VFX skills. I do p yeah. recommend picking up shaders, creation skills. Uh, it does make you more creative. It does help you to think of different ways that you could do something that you otherwise wouldn't and it helps you communicate with everyone else because you have to remember the lighting artist is probably one of the few departments that has to deal with everyone 
even sound people because if a gunshot fires you need the sound to work with the, the light the flashlight and the vfx guy needs to make it work as well uh the timing with animation you know so even that little thing you're involved so definitely get along with people uh and and understand what people are doing uh also gives you a little bit more respect when you kind of dabble a little bit right it's it's human nature we respect someone who has some way of showing that they've done a little bit of something than nothing at all yeah i uh, i definitely agree with the vfx stuff like you don't need to make like a game like an end product box product game ready vfx like something that if you were to make a vfx something like it just gets the idea across that you know it, when the vfx if you have a vfx size when they get when their like workload is more free they can come in and maybe make something that is a bit more like polished you know it it, it just needs to be it can be a placeholder vfx or a placeholder like like script or something that that ju does the job it might not do it super well but it does it enough where you could be like this is the kind of thing i was thinking and then someone who's like more technically minded or someone like a vfx size can come in and you know make something a bit more fancy I think that's that's always yeah. useful. Follow up question by Marco. Also, to follow up what you just said, I sometimes tend to focus just on the one angle shot. How do you approach composition on bigger scenes? Ooh <laughs> big man so, question. Yeah, so composition's an interesting one. I think uh, that's something I'm still looking into, if I'm being honest, because uh, it's a it's quite a wide subject. Uh, I'm I'm learning. I'm looking at a lot of photography and cinema photography books right now and like um and uh videos like art videos uh to try and like understand uh like good angles and good like um and good ways to like represent your art piece um something i recommend doing is um going out going out into the, the big wide world and taking pictures yourself and trying to figure out what makes good composition for like a scene and then try and maybe you can use that knowledge to apply it to like larger scenes itself um but um there's basically if you can nail the basics if you can nail the basics down you can always apply those but that basics to the to the wider knowledge where you can get something that looks good and is 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 of good composition um it might not be the, the most fanciest like way of doing it but like it will be, it will look good because you've got those, you've got those basic beats being hit because you've you've practiced it, you've read up on it, you know. Um, what about you, Emmett? Um, I think when it comes to it depends if it's a personal project or team project. Uh, generally, as a team, you want to coordinate with the 3D team and kind of talk about where the focal point is, where, where is the level designer. So normally you want to talk to the level designer and other team members. So you're constantly discussing the leading lines, uh, where is the player going, uh, what's the, the main point of this environment. And of course they can look around, they can have a look, that's that's not a problem. But we, we would not gonna do worse lighting everywhere else. There's a, a purpose behind the lighting and you're aware of the lighting. Um, Understanding architectural lighting, uh, I think I have about two, three thousand pounds worth of uh, professional lighting design documentation. So, for people who want to become actual lighting designers in in the real world, um, I have a friend who who has been doing it, and uh, I was helping him become a lighting artist. And in exchange, he was teaching me. Uh, how the real world works and how we think about uh, museums. Why are the lights pointing up in certain museums? What time of day? And how do you think about light pollution? How do you think about light chaos uh, in the environment? And how they analyze these things is quite intriguing. And I think that is useful to understand composition in terms of lighting. But then again, you have to remember composition is a viewing an image from a holistic point of view. I think a lot of people lack that ability. Uh, you need to look at the image, you to look at the material. So when I do my lighting and, and my projects that I'm involved with, I will um, talk to uh, the department. If I see something red and it's disturbing the, the main story or the main purpose or the main environment, I will request to, to remove the red color because it's ruining the composition and it's and the focus and the other angle if someone goes and does something else. Um, yeah, so 
being able to understand how you construct an image is probably why it's a good idea to learn a little bit uh, environment art or environment design or just drawing and painting very good as well to kind of learn uh, these theories and what makes a pleasant image uh, from one point of view and then practice doing it multiple times so an exercise for you mark you would be do lighting from one shot make it look good now I'd pick a new shot and ask yourself why does this look shit okay and then okay how can you keep the lighting that you just did on one angle but still improve the lighting here or what sacrifices do you need to do and what's the balance right so when you do that it's very difficult very difficult but as you do that a 360 rotation you're going to end up with a very specific overall lighting scheme that allows you to have the focal point the direction you want but it looks good at every angle so that's what we were talking about earlier when people are doing their pretty portfolio lighting it is still one direction it looks good for a very specific reason because it's constructed with that one shot in mind and you want to stand out and the way to stand out is to be able to do that with a little bit less quality because you also want to cover the other angles a little bit but it takes practice and you definitely need to understand where can the player go where can the player look and there's always going to be a shitty place they can look and you didn't <laughs> predict i mean i was playing um I think I was playing uh, high on life a little bit uh, last week or something. Uh, it's, the, it's the game that's very adult but comedic and has talking guns in it. And I was doing a jetpack and I dropped behind the building and it was completely, uh, obviously not something you was meant to do. So I was looking around and, you know, it was all rubble and there was nothing going on and there was no lighting because they didn't expect someone to find a hole that can actually look behind the the fake exterior so uh, just be aware of that and yeah that's about it that's all we have time for i am two minutes late for my mentorship session with my students uh, already because of this long answer but probably some of them are watching anyway so they know i'm here uh so thank you for watching and if you want to meet up and talk or ask questions you can always do that we have a discord channel if you don't I already know about it you can join that as well if you need to get a hold of edward uh you know just look up his name or i'm assuming you followed him when his art station window was up because that's one of the reasons we do it uh so thank you for watching uh see you guys around and um just so you know we have uh, i think this wednesday we have a portfolio review session with dynasty empire so Join Discord and put up your links as well, and we'll keep going as long as we have new content from you guys to talk about. So thank you again. Have a great weekend, and I will just talk a little bit with Edward before I head off. So have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, thank you.